The outbreak of World War I in August of 1914 saw many Australians eager to fight for the British Empire and travel the world. Little did they know at the time the costs that would befall all those involved, both in casualties and utter destruction. When war was declared against Germany on the 4th of August 1914, it saw a shift in relationships on the home front. Suddenly it mattered where you were from and whose blood you had coursing through your veins. They considered anybody with a German background or born in Germany was a potential threat to the security of Australia in the First World War. And so they rounded them up and put them down in Torrens Island, which was totally surrounded by water. People of German heritage were required to report to their local police station and give what was called their parole, which is the French word for word. You have to give your word that you are not going to be disloyal to the king or the empire. And there were various conditions. So for most people, they had to report to their local police station every week. And then if you broke your parole, that is broke your word, and didn't show up or were seen as being disloyal, you could then be interned. When the camp first opened, life for the inmates was quite boring, with very little to do on such a barren island. The relationship between the inmates and guards was familiar and bearable. So the camp was very rudimentary. The internees were housed in canvas tents, eight to a tent or seven or eight to a tent. They did their own cooking with basic rations. Relationships were hard to maintain, of course. A lot of these men had families and there were very strict rules about communicating with your family and when your family could come and visit them and so on. Pretty awful, actually. Well, particularly when Hawks came in, Captain Hawks. It was quite reasonable before. They were allowed to have a newspaper, they could have concert, they staged plays. One of those to be interned at Torrens Island was German-born Frank Bungardi. On the 5th of August 1914, Frank was living in Broken Hill with his wife and two young children, working as a minor and part-time boxer. After the Broken Hill massacre, Frank, along with many other Germans residing in the town, were arrested and transported to Adelaide, where they would be interned at Torrens Island. During his internment, Frank kept a diary detailing the mistreatment and events that occurred as a prisoner of war in Australia. When he was interned, he wrote that his occupation was pugilist boxer, and he's, he was known as a boxer around the place, but his day job was as a miner, worked at Broken Hill, and he kept a diary which is now in the State Library of New South Wales, and it's a wonderful, vivid first-hand account. His diary is quite heart-wrenching. He talks about being torn away from his weeping wife and his weeping children. And one of the things that he's very articulate about is that his wife is also being punished for no other reason than she is married to someone with whom, across the world, the British are at war with the country of his birth. He, he makes the point that how is that fair for his wife? The Bengali tried to escape, but his two daughters I interviewed years and years ago when they were still alive and they said he was actually shot in the water when he was trying to escape. Now I've never read this and they just said it. Typical of the guards at the time because they were shooting just at the, the, the internees just for fun, you know, practically like rabbits. He was the one that in a hotel met an AWL, an absent without leave Australian soldier, and they swapped, he took the, the soldier's uniform and, and the soldier took his civilian uniform and Bangadi was free for several months when he was in a post office and unfortunately, just by chance, the policeman there recognised him when he was posting a letter home to his mother. And so he, that's how he was caught again. Paul Dubotsky was another German-born inmate who, when war broke out, was a photographer staying in New Guinea on a German expedition through Southeast Asia. He witnessed the mobilisation of German forces and found himself in Adelaide, where he lived for a short amount of time until he was interned on the 1st of February, 1915. Paul Dubotsky was a photographer. He joined some sort of expedition to Papua New Guinea in uh, 1913. And by 1914, he was living in Adelaide. He was interned and he took his camera with him. He set up a studio on the camp. He was making portraits and postcards and selling them to internees and his photographs also documented the abuse that later went on in the camp. So it's from his work that we have a wonderful visual record of life on Torrens Island. He was the photographer. He even took more photographs when he went to Liverpool in New South Wales. I think he was deported after the war. 
Why, again, nobody knows, probably only because he took photographs and, and the last thing the government really wanted was a permanent record of how these people had been treated. In early 1915, Captain George Edward Hawkes was appointed the role of Camp Commandant at the Torrens Island concentration camp. From that moment on, the lifestyle within the camp would dramatically change to what we remember it as today. When the Hawks came in, he allowed the soldiers to bayonet the people as they walked around. He allowed them to, when they were going for walks, to shoot at their feet, to, to terrify them. What happened was a shift. When he was appointed to that position, relationships between the internees and the guards really turned sour very quickly. When people were being marshaled into lines, some of the guards used the bayonets that were on the end of their rifles to do that. There was a, a yard set up, a barbed wire yard, which was called the Hotel de Ville, which is a sort of joke, it's a town hall. There was a period when internees were held in that yard for two weeks outside. Dubotsky talks about people hiding in their tents during the day because they were too frightened to come out. Hawks is documented to have fired into tents where he knew people were. He says he was firing at rabbits, but there were, every day there were apparently shots fired. On the 19th of June 1915, two prisoners managed to escape Torrens Island and were later recaptured in the Adelaide Hills and returned to the island five days later. The consequences that followed saw the end of Hawks. Two men escaped and were recaptured in the Adelaide Hills, brought back to the island and Hawks had them stripped and whipped um, in full view of the internees. Now the only reason this came out, I found quite fascinating, because inadvertently, you know, the paranoia was so great, they locked up a Swede by mistake. Because what's the difference? But I mean, in those days, what's the difference between a Swede and a German, for goodness sake? They both speak a terrible foreign language. He was flogged with the cat and nine tails very badly, the Swede and the German. Then that got back to Germany. The Germans threatened reprisals against British subjects in Germany if the Australian government didn't do something about Torrens Island. And so it was pressure from the British government that got rid of Captain Hawkes, not the Australian government. Those abuses of prisoners ended up getting Hawkes stripped of his commission and there were two inquiries into the conditions in the camps while he was commandant. Torrens Island concentration camp was closed in mid-August 1915, with the majority of the internees being transferred to the Holsworthy camp near Liverpool, New South Wales, and the Trial Bay camp near Kempsey, New South Wales. On the way to Holsworthy, Frank Bengardi escaped his captivity by jumping from the train. He was recaptured and served out the rest of the war and beyond in Holsworthy. In October 1919, he was repatriated on the Valencia without his wife and two children who remained in Adelaide. Not long after his return to Germany, Frank Bengardi was killed as a result of a knockout blow received during a bout in Kiak. When Torrens Island was closed, Paul Dubotsky was transferred to Trial Bay where he captured eye-opening shots of the camp and its prisoners. He remained at the camp until May of 1919, where he was repatriated aboard the Kursk. He settled back into life in the Bavarian town of Duren, just outside of Munich. He re-established his career as a photographer, got married and had three children. Unfortunately, the outbreak of World War II was not kind to him either. His only son was killed during the conflict. Dubotsky died in 1969 and was survived by his two daughters who showed the world their father's work and told his story.